feels like it's been a while since we've had church. It's only been two weeks. Just missed uh, one Sunday, but it feels a lot longer. So let's go ahead and begin with 2 Timothy 2, 17 through 18, which says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. And so the topic of today's sermon is the error of preterism. As we can see, they're calling it an error back in Timothy's time, in Paul's time. And as some of you may know, the error of preterism is spreading like wildfire in the modern church. Uh, it's, it's pretty prevalent today. I know people that, that are born-again Christians who claim Christ as the exclusive way to heaven who are partial preterists. But basically, in brief, preterism is the idea that the book of Revelation is to be read as history rather than future prophecy. Okay, so it's the doctrine, it's pretty confusing, it's the doctrine that the book of Revelation and end times prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70 with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jewish temple. Okay, so now preterism, as I mentioned, it's becoming pretty prevalent even in the modern church today. Has anyone heard of Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man, right? Pretty, pretty big guy, you know, he had a pretty big show, big following. Or, or how about R.C. Sprawl? Has anyone heard of R.C. Sprawl? Pretty big name, right? They are both partial preterists, among others, that, that we see. Okay, so they're at least partial preterists, which is the blending of the classical view of the millennial reign of Christ with full preterism. It's kind of a hybrid uh, between the two. And there's a pretty big spectrum of, of differing beliefs when it comes to partial preterism with no actual consensus. So you might run across people who identify as partial preterists and, uh, but they don't even have consensus. There's, different, there's a different spectrum of views when it comes to partial preterism versus full preterism, which just views the book of Revelation as already having been fulfilled in AD 70 with the fall of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple. But before we begin, it's important to define a few of the related terms uh, when it comes to eschatology or end times theology. Let's begin with the big three. These are the big three phrases or words that you usually hear. Premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. Those are the, the big three most of you have already heard. Well, let's start with, let's just give like a basic definition of all of these uh, before we get into what full preterism is because they really tie in together in many ways. Let's start with premillennialism. Okay, premillennialism. This is the classic orthodox view that the second coming is a future event and that Christ will return literally and physically. So this is the classic view. It's the orthodox view. This is the view that I take. I'm a premillennialist um, in, in that sense. I don't usually like to box myself into these labels, but this one is pretty clear. Okay, there's a future coming of the second uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it's literal and it's physical. Uh, this means that when Jesus returns, Jesus will initiate the millennial reign in which Christ ushers in a thousand-year golden age of peace, justice, and pros uh, prosperity. This is when all the nations of the world will pay homage to Christ, ruling from Israel from the city of Jerusalem specifically is where Jesus is going to set up his headquarters. So that land, uh, no matter where you fall on, on Zionism and all that, that land is, is still relevant to biblical prophecy. Uh, and it's important for us to understand. So this uh, premillennialism is also the historic orthodox view of the early church. So this, this was the view of, of like the first Christians um, and the early Christians and the apostles, I believe. And it's pretty clear history does back that up. Um, you had mainstream early Christian theo uh, theo uh, theologians. What am I saying? <laughs> theologians. Just Man, maybe that, that little Omicron got to my head a little bit. I don't know. 
Okay, so you had these early theologians like Justin Martyr, uh, Tertullian, Papias. Uh, Papias is said to have been a companion of John the Apostle. So he knew John the Apostle, traveled with him, knew him. Um, and, and also uh, Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. All of them, historically, now just looking outside the confines of the Bible, we rely on the Bible, but there's historical evidence as a secondary measure, as a secondary evidence of, of these things. And Polycarp, who was also a disciple of John, also took this view, the pre-millennialist view, that Jesus is still yet to come. It's a future literal second coming as we believe today. So this is orthodox historic Christianity. Uh, premillennialism was popular even before the Nicene Creed of 320, and it was prevalent as early as 8100, formally in different writings of the early church. So there was an early Christian witness to premillennialism. Now this view died out uh, to a great extent with the Roman Catholic era of Constantine. As Constantine uh, came in uh, with the amalgamation of the Roman Empire with ecumenical Christianity, uh, this, this belief, this orthodox view started dying out more for preterism and, and partial preterism. And it wasn't revived until during the Reformation or for post-millennialism and amillennialism, which we'll get to in a minute. And this wasn't revived until during the Reformation period. Okay? During the Reformation, people started you know, reforming the church and going back to this premillennialist view. It was revived in history by the Anabaptists, which are the Baptists, you know, led to the Baptists of today, um, and the Huguenots. So the Anabaptists and the, and the, and the Huguenots went back to this, started you know, bringing it up as teaching again in the, during the Reformation. And then later it was by the Puritans during the post-Reformation era. So the Puritans uh, with their Geneva Bibles, 1599 Geneva Bibles that came to America with that Bible, who are Calvinists, which you know we have differing views on that, but they were premillennialists, uh, premillennial Calvinists. And so it became, again, orthodoxy. It became the, the fundamental view of the church. Uh, during the Reformation and post-Reformation. And so this is what we believe, a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ immediately occurring after the second coming. So Jesus returns at the moment of his return, he wipes out the wicked, he establishes his rule, and he, the, the, the dead are resurrected at that point, we get new glorified bodies and we rule and reign with Christ. So that's the premillennial view. Um, <clears throat> and so, this is when the first resurrection will occur. We will be bodily resurrected at the return of Jesus while we reign with him. That's how we can live for a thousand years uh, during that reign. We'll have our glorified bodies. And so we'll rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years on the earth, specifically has to be on the earth itself, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So what are some of these prophecies? Uh, you have, for example, Zechariah 14.9. It says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Whenever the Bible says in that day, in the day of the Lord, right? It's speaking of the, the you know, final return. Uh, in that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. So we have a picture of a king uh, ruling over the entire earth. That would, of course, be the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, or Ezekiel 43, 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet. Notice that he mentions his physical, literal feet standing on the earth. There's, it's, that's very specific. And the places of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. So God is going to rule and reign, and his feet are going to be standing on the earth. It's a literal, physical description, unless you want to allegorize it away, as the preterists will do, as, as you'll see. All right, another famous Old Testament passage regarding the millennium is Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, that's Mount Zion, the 
top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So that's one of the marks of the millennium. All of the nations of the world, there are going to be different nations, all peoples, all tongues, all nations, right? This, this idea of, of, you know, nations with borders is actually very biblical. We, we retain our, our, you know, national identities, uh, even in, in the new earth and new heaven. And we see that it says that all of them, all the nations are going to flow, they're going to like, you know, pay homage and make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to see the Lord Jesus, basically. And so that, I don't recall a time in history when all the nations were paying homage to God in in Jerusalem since his return, right? We haven't seen that fulfilled yet. Verse 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So this will be a golden age of peace and justice, where in righteousness, where God's law is coming out of Jerusalem. Um, so the millennium is that time of peace. We haven't seen a worldwide global time of peace yet. So that itself on its face refutes preterism and the other, you know, post-millennialism and all, all kinds of stuff, uh, or amillennialism. Now, there are different types of premillennialism, including historic premillennialism, which, which is you know, the, or with the early church beliefs, which I, I believe, and we'll, we've gotten into end times eschatology and timing of the rapture, not something we all have to be on the same page on, but it's pretty clear when, in my studies of this topic that the historic view, that the early church view uh, was historic premillennialism, which rejected the pre-trip rapture, among other things. Then there's the dispensational premillennialist view, so there's different kinds of premillennialist views, which, come, which came in the age of Darby and Schofield, which is pre-trib, and they also attribute the tribulation to the Jews rather than to the entire church. How did the pre-trib idea not come about until just like a couple hundred years ago? I, and this is, you know, we, this is controversial, but um, I believe it came through, the, through Darby and Schofield. There is the Schofield... Uh, commentary uh, uh, on the Bible, and those views were popularized during that period. Um, we're going to get into more of the timing of the end times. Again, not a, not a fundamental, like you can be pre-trib and be in this church. That's okay. You know, um, that this is like one of those fun topics we can sharpen iron and look at this scripture, look at that, and that's okay as long as we all believe in nothing but the blood of Jesus like we preached, right? But I have my views, and you know, I believe this is the historic view of, uh, you know, premillennialism. Um, and so there's differing views even in the premillennialist outlook. But generally speaking, it's a literal second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's the important thing. You know, all premillennialists will agree on that. If you deny the second coming of Jesus Christ, the future second coming of Jesus Christ, that could be a problem. That would be considered heresy, right? When you When you... Uh, anything that's not orthodoxy, in essence, is heresy. Anything that's not, you know, the fundamental essence of, of Scripture and what the early, you know, what the Apostle John believed and what Paul believed would be, would be heresy. When it comes to uh, s- fundamental, like, salvific uh, beliefs and, and major doctrines like that. So... By contrast, let's look at the amillennialist view next. So the amillennial uh, millennial view takes the position that there will be no millennial reign of the saints with Christ on earth. There just there won't be one. They're, they don't believe it's like anti-millennial. There is no millennial reign. They interpret the thousand years symbolically or as allegorical of the church age. We are the millennium. This is it. You know, um, and so this is where you can see it'll tie into preterism. Um, so most preterists are going to be amillennial, 
post-millennial. Partial preterists tend to be more post-millennial. We'll get to that in, in a second. But they interpret it all. It's all symbolic uh, when it comes to the amillennialist. They actually view Christ's first coming as the inauguration of the kingdom. That's when the kingdom actually began. And a second coming they view as the consummation of the age. That'll be the end of the millennium. That'll be, so the millennium is just symbolic of the, of the church age, is, is what they teach. So the kingdom began at his first coming, and it will be fulfilled or end at his second coming, is, is the view that they take. So the Amil position takes a kingdom now or millennial now approach. You might have heard that kingdom now. It's here right now. We are in the kingdom, right? I'm hearing that more and more today among saved born again Christians. It's pretty, pretty common. Uh, the, pre, the pre-mill view um, that we believe is a futurist view, right? It's not yet happened. Whereas the amill view believes that the church age is the start of the kingdom and we're living in it now. So the, the amillennialist uh, views even the 1,000 years as a generic number. They see it as just a general number, as symbolic or representative of a long age. It's not literally exactly 1,000 years as we believe. So they point to uh, verses like Psalm 8410. <clears throat> Psalm 8410, which says, For a day in the courts is better than a thousand. So a day in the courts of the Lord is better than a thousand days in the courts. They say, well, that's kind of just general uh, representing a long time. Uh, Job 9, 3, it says, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. This is what what the book of Job says. So the book of Job isn't saying that one in a thousand can contend with God. It's not saying there's a literal number where, you know, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand, like one in a thousand can't answer back to God. Well, he's not saying one in a thousand can, but that, you know, or like, you know, 1,000 can't and one person can. This is a more general way of saying that no one can answer to the Lord. No one can, can speak back to God. And so this uh, legitimately is a generic way in, in the book of Job to, to use the word thousand. But it doesn't mean that that should be applied to the entire Bible. You, you, read, the, you read the context. So the number 1,000 there is used generically or generally. And that's what the amillennialist believes about the length of the millennium, that we're in it now and it's just a general long period of time. Finally, the post-millennial view. Post-millennialism doesn't take the view that the millennium has already begun. It's post, it's after, it it's, uh, hasn't begun yet. It takes the position that the church is commissioned with ushering in <clears throat> the 1,000 year reign of Christ that the second coming of Christ takes place after, not before the millennial reign, once the church has established a global peace. So it's up to the church in the post mill view to usher in the kingdom. It's up to us. And this is why it's famous or prevalent among many abortion abolitionists. Uh, They're motivated by this drive to end abortion, which is a good thing. We want to end abortion too. But a part of that motivation is that they're helping to usher in the kingdom. Once we outlaw abortion and go back to, you know, the law and uh, not allowing homosexuality in, in in the world and all of these things, that's when we as the church are commissioned to bring about the, the millennial reign of Christ is, is what they teach. So it's not that Jesus will return as we believe. Some of you look confused by this because it is confusing, these, these, different, these differing views. You know, it doesn't really quite jive with the rest of the Bible. Uh, but you know, what we believe is that the church is gonna, Jesus himself is gonna return and wipe out abortion and, and institute the law with a rod of iron and set up the golden age. Uh, the post mill view believes that it's up to us to do this, you know, and that once we do it, then Christ will return and set up his millennial reign and rule over the world. <laughs> it's never going to. Right. It's crazy. So, you know, that's that's the view. Um, Christ will only return once the millennium has been established by us. 
So that's contrary, as Megan, you know, pointed out, is that it's contrary to what we're witnessing uh, in the world today. Postmillennialists, uh, by definition, have to believe that the world will become a better and better place over time. Um, you know, as the church exerts its authority and positions in the affairs of men, that it's our responsibility to establish Christ's kingdom on earth. Again, this is why the, the abolitionists, uh, a lot of them are post-millennial for this reason. They believe it's up to the church. The church is failing at their job of ushering in the millennial reign. Uh, that's why they need, we need to be out there uh, preaching against abortion. I'm all for preaching against abortion. You know, that's why a lot of people get drawn into it, at, you know, and there's a lot of many abolitionists who don't know about this stuff. But you get a lot of the leaders, T. Russell Hunter and others, are partial preterists. Um, I don't know where James White and all, you know, and, and the other guys are on this. Um, you could probably look that up, but I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if they, he is partial preterist. Yeah, probably pre partial, I would guess, if, if um, yeah. Torba, the founder of Gap, a lot of people have gone to the Gap platform. He's yeah. a full preterist. Wow. Yeah, there's some full preterists in Idaho, in North Idaho, and there's some, you know, and some partial. And so it's, it's more prevalent than you think, uh, which is why I wanted to preach on this. It's, it's like a resurgence of these uh, older heresies that, that we see. Um, so now all, all of this uh, is easily refuted by 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. It says, This know, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So when did Paul say that these people are going to have these like horrible characteristics and these wicked type of attributes? He said, in the last days perilous times shall come. And people are not getting better, they're getting worse. So does this sound like the world is getting better or does it sound like the world is going to only get worse as we head into the last days, right? Now we're going to have valleys and dips and like the stock market's going to go up and down and, you know, um, we're going to have times of where the world appears to be getting better in, in many ways or, you know, things are going to uh, improve for a time. But in the end, we're on a downward trajectory over time. Um, our experience, just living in the world, has, has shown that the systems of the world, the governments of the world, are becoming only more and more tyrannical and that people are increasingly rejecting God and traditional Christian values and doctrines and ethics, right? So that's, that's what we're witnessing. We're not witnessing things get better, uh, we're witnessing things get worse. I mean, just look at the role of gender and sexuality in our culture, right? These things are not getting better. We're not morally getting better in those things. In fact, we have empirical evidence that according to the Christian worldview, many things are getting worse. All you have to do is look at the Democrat Party. So preterism. <laughs> you can't get any more empirical than that. Okay, so preterism. Let's get to preterism now that we've kind of laid a, a foundation of, of views. You can see how these are very closely related. So preterism is the doctrine that, <clears throat> as I mentioned, that end times prophecies in the book of Revelation are merely history and were fulfilled in AD 70. Okay, so... <clears throat> For example, when we read about the tribulation, the Antichrist, the second coming, or the millennial reign, we are reading Revelation or the Bible as an historical event uh, or account of past events. So the, uh, the term preterism itself is from the Latin praetor, 
which means that something is past or beyond. So preterism itself means that it's past, it's history, it's already been fulfilled. Uh, by contrast, futurism is the fundamental Christian view that biblical prophecy, including portions of Ezekiel, Daniel, and the book of Revelation, are literal future and physical apocalyptic events that are still yet to come. So preterists are generally divided into the two camps, full and partial preterism. And even the partial preterists, which themselves um, have a range or spectrum of beliefs without any real consensus, consider the full preterist to be outright heretic. So if you talk to a partial preterist, they're like, oh no, uh, preterism is, is heretical. But we believe some of the, it's half of the things that they believe in essence, you know. Um, so complete or full preterists believe that all of Revelation is fulfilled, even the rapture, the final judgment, and the renewal of the creation itself. You know, the regeneration of the, the new heaven and the new earth. It's all symbolic. Um, it's to be understood symbolically. What makes the partial preterists different is that while they usually deny a future tribulation and rapture, they will deny you know, the, the uh, tribulation and the rapture. They just believe we usher in the kingdom and, and Jesus comes back and, and rules. Uh, they believe that this, they, they do, however, believe that the second coming and the resurrection and the final judgment are still yet to come. So at least they believe that. They don't deny the second literal coming of Christ, which is why a lot of actual believers who aren't just false converts have been deceived into partial preterism as well. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if they, they believe that maybe after you die, you'll go to be with God or, you know, but as far as like this present world, this is it and it's just going to continue on forever. You know, the full preterist um, doesn't that doesn't take into account, you know, the, the idea of decay and the world is decaying and, you know, um, they just think it's eternally just going to keep going, basically, um, which, you know, doesn't. Even science would, would disagree with that. <clears throat> so at least, you know, the partial preterist doesn't deny the second coming, the final judgment. So that's good. Uh, they believe in partial past fulfillment of end times prophecy. It's just that they have this kingdom now mentality for mostly being post-millennialist. Now, I'm not saying all of them are post-millennialist. You know, there's a range. So uh, there's always people that come back and say, oh, you were misrepresented my view, but this is not, there's no consensus exactly on the, on the partial preterist view. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, this is the idea of the church taking authority over the world, establishing the kingdom, which is already here. And this also branches off into dominionism, um, which is the idea of, you know, taking control of the government as, as Christians and ushering in the kingdom, basically. But all preterists, including full and partial preterists, center their theology around the year A.D. 70. Okay, it all comes down to A.D. 70. Uh, what happened in A.D. 70? This was when the Roman Emperor Vespasian, the successor of Nero, ordered his son Titus to destroy Jerusalem. Okay, so at which point the Jewish temple was also destroyed and just you know, all the stones toppled, as, as Jesus himself said. So the, the preterists will point to when Jesus said in Matthew 24, 2, <clears throat> and he said, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, so now we can all agree with the partial preterist about this verse, that it was a fulfillment of, of Jesus's words, you know, Jesus prophesied this. Okay, but that doesn't mean that we adopt the entire system of partial preterism because there's some commonality. A lot of these false teachings are gonna take biblical truths and then advance them to a heretical position. You know, so we're gonna have some commonality with the partial preterist. It doesn't mean that we, we are partial preterists. Okay, historically, preterists and partial preterists both if you look at the historical documents, whether they know this or not in today's age, the, the scholars and, and the people that came up with these systems have generally agreed that the first systematic preterist paper 
or exposition was written in the 1600s. Okay, so preterism as a formal theology might have been around earlier, but as a formality came around the 1600s by a Jesuit, by a Jesuit monk named Luis del Alcazar. Okay, so if you're a partial preterist, you need to look into this, you know. This whole doctrine started by a Jesuit monk. This is public knowledge. You can look this up. Um, the preterist view was later adopted in the 1800s. A lot of heresy occurred in the 1800s uh, by Christian Protestants. They, the Protestants picked this up at, at some point, some Protestants, not all. Um, and so this is all to say that this is not the historic view of the early church. There's no evidence that there, was, that there were any partial or, or full preterists in the Bible except Hymenaeus and um, who was the other guy that, that Paul rebuked? Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, right? He said they deny the resurrection, they deny the second coming, uh, and so the early preterists were called out as, as heretics. <coughs> okay, so one problem that both preterists and partial preterists have in order to defend their, their view is the dating of the book of Revelation. Okay, the dating of the book of Revelation. Revelation. Historically, it's, it's generally accepted that the book of Revelation was written sometime around 8095 to 8096. That's, that's when the book of Revelation, most Christian historians, scholars, orthodox view is that it was written 8095 by the apostle John, right? When he was exiled, perhaps on the island of, of Patmos. That's when he wrote uh, the Revelation. So this would mean that the events of Revelation could not have been about AD 70 if they were already passed because they were written after AD 70. Okay, so this is a major problem with the preterist view. They're saying it's historical, it was already fulfilled, but it was written after the events that they're saying it, it referenced. Um, so they, they would have to date the book of Revelation before AD 70, and that's what they attempt to do. That's their claim, that no, 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 it was really written sometime in the 60s, like 65 to 68, and it was fulfilled shortly after that. Um, <clears throat> so, but again, all early prominent Christians, theologians, including Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, uh, Eusebius, who was an early Christian historian, look, you can look all of these people up, Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin. Uh, all of them, whether you agree with all these people or not, all of them date the book of Revelation uh, during the reign of the, the end of the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian, Domitian which was around 8095 or 96. Domitian was the, was the son of Vespasian, um, and uh, he was just the next Roman emperor at that point, which was 1895 to 96, is when it was the end of his reign. And most scholars, most traditional scholars, date it to 1895 or 96. So they don't really have a strong case for the dating of the book of Revelation. Let's look at some scripture next. Um, the Preterist, first and foremost, points to the Olivet Discourse as, as their main text to, for, for them. And they say, see, this was all fulfilled, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus was not talking about the final end times. He was talking about AD 70. The Olivet Discourse is Jesus' teaching about the last days. This is the chapter that lists the events of what premillennialists define as the tribulation period, right? So we believe in the tribulation, whether you think we'll be here or not, isn't the question today. It's whether we even believe there is a tribulation is, is the question that's being debated. And so, you know, in, in Matthew 24, the, the, the part of the Olivet Discourse I'm most familiar with, it says, for nations, in verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, right? So there's going to be a world war prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. If it was just 8070, that was just Rome against Jerusalem, 
Rome against Israel. So it, it's not talking just about Jerusalem. Uh, if, you're, if you're reading the Bible literally, when, when it's clearly literally explained in these passages. You know, and then Jesus talks about love waxing cold and family members betraying one another. He talks about the abomination of desolation, which we interpret as the Antichrist. Uh, this is the chapter where we get, uh, in verse 29, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun and the moon be darkened, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. In verse 29, after the tribulation, and then we see Jesus says, comes and gathers the elect from the four corners of the earth um, and gathers them into heaven. Now, those who deny this will say, well, that was just, he's talking to the Jews only. It's not for the church. Uh, it's just for the Jews, right? Um, so it depends what your view is on that. But the preterist doesn't see this as a future apocalyptic vision of the last days. He sees it, the preterist sees it as a fulfillment of Nero, the Roman emperor, who they believe was the actual antichrist and the destruction of the Jewish nation as the end of the world. It was an end of an era, an end of an age, is, is what they believe. The book of Revelation wasn't written to warn us about the antichrist to come. It was written to the Jews to warn them about Nero, who did come in and destroy Jerusalem. Okay, so we do see a partial fulfillment of, of Matthew 24. But one thing you need to understand about prophecy is that it's often dualistic in nature. You know, all of the prophets would, would prophesy against like some wicked king in their present time or, or, or like a soon to come king. Um, and they would rebuke him and then that would get fulfilled. But it also, you'd see, would be fulfilled in another longer term event five, six hundred years later, a thousand years later. Um, so I believe that, you know, yes, 8070 was a fulfillment of prophecy, but it was a foreshadowing a type of the final tribulation to come, of the final last days to come. What happened to, to just little Jerusalem as a type, as a warning to the rest of the world is going to happen to the entire world, to the entire earth, to all the nations uh, in the last days. So Nero, I think, was a type, and you know, the Bible loves its types and foreshadows. Nero was a type and a foreshadow of the final beast of Revelation, the Antichrist to come. So, <clears throat> you know, the preterist, though, will hang on verse 34 in Matthew 24. And this is the main verse that they use, which says, Jesus said unto them, after he described all these events, Jesus said in verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, who is this generation? That's, that becomes the question. What is, which generation is Jesus referring to? Well, the preterists will look at this and say, well, yeah, he's talking to us right now. So he's talking, he's saying your generation won't pass until all of the events in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 are fulfilled. The, the, the premillennialist and those, the futurist who sees it as a future event of tribulation and return will say this is talking about the generation this generation, he just described an entire generation of those who will betray one another, who will be betrayed and, and wars will come, you know, world wars will happen. He's saying when this generation begins to see these things coming to pass before their eyes, this generation will not pass away until Jesus comes back. So the way I see it, the view of this, this body here is that, you know, once we enter the tribulation period, once we see brother betraying brother and, and you know, false Christs appearing and all this stuff happening that Jesus describes, then we know that we are the generation that will see the return of Jesus Christ. It's this generation that goes through the tribulation that Jesus is referring to in verse 34. So it's just a matter of how do you understand? How do you exegete God's word? You know, um, you have to put it all together, every bit and every part in context and understand this. Because remember, <clears throat> in verse 8, Jesus said all these are the beginning of sorrows, not the end of sorrows. You know, this is like, this is when we're in it. You know, this is the beginning when you see these happens, uh, happening. 
So we don't deny AD 70 as, as fulfillment, but we see it as an example to the greater world of, of what's to come. All right, so, <clears throat> you know, I talked about dualistic prophecy. Uh, that's what I see as the short-sightedness of the preterist is that they're not considering the duality of prophecy. For example, God told King David that his throne would be established forever through his offspring. You know, he said, I will establish your throne forever. You'll have a son. Well, that was fulfilled in the immediate in King Solomon. He did. Solomon was like the greatest king uh, that ever lived, the most prosperous, the richest, the wisest. It was a, a picture of the millennial reign. It was a picture of Christ. There was no war during Solomon's reign. He wasn't a blood, he wasn't, you know, a man of war. He didn't shed blood. There was peace, there was prosperity, there was justice. You know, you had that, that proverb of Solomon where he said to cut that baby in half and divide him, right? He was administering justice. Um, and so that's just a picture of the millennial reign. So it was an immediate fulfilled in Solomon, but God wasn't just saying, David, you're going to have Solomon, and that's, that's the end of prophecy. He was saying, through your seed, because Jesus came through the seed of David, uh, there's going to be a millennial reign that's forever, and it's going to be peaceful, and there's going to be no more war. They'll, you know, take their um, <clears throat> their swords and and uh, melt them down and make, uh, you know, plowshares and all of that. So, by the preterist logic, if you're a preterist and you're consistent, you would have to say that those prophecies were fulfilled in Solomon only, and that's the end of it, because you know. It's just what it what it says, and there's no there's no future uh, prophecy. It also says that the nations that don't come to you know give homage to Jesus will be they'll get no rain. They'll be cut off. Yeah. Yeah, like they won't get rain on their nation. Oh, like rain, like yeah. water rain, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's a part of you know Jesus is going to rule uh, with a rod of iron and punish the nations who don't you know, adhere to him as king. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is a type. 8070 is merely a type. Um, look also at Revelation 1-7, okay? Because the preterist, at least the full preterist, claims that the second coming of Christ was not physical, but spiritual. Okay, but that's contrary to the plain reading of Scripture. Revelation 1-7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds... And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So it literally says every eye shall see him. Okay. It's not spiritual because the, the uh, full preterist just teaches that, you know, Jesus is now ruling and reigning in heaven and on earth. And that his second coming was only spiritual. That's why we didn't notice it. He spiritually returned in AD 70 and judged Jerusalem, and it was the end of the old Mosaic system um, of, of rule. The old religious system was done away with, and now we're in the millennium. Jesus already returned, and, and that was it. It was a spiritual return. Okay, so, but this says, every eye shall see him. The preterists can't explain that away. Uh, Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So again, it's something that we will physically, literally see with our, with our own eyes. Um, not only will he physically appear, but it says that we also will appear with him in glory. You know, so how does that work? We're, we're raptured, we're taken up to meet him in the sky and we come right back in our glorified bodies. It says we're translated the twinkling of an eye in a moment, right? So the moment we're raptured, we're, we're glorified, we're resurrected, we, we're given new bodies and we come back and we rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. So that's in our resurrected bodies. First Corinthians fifteen fifty two. in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So none of that has occurred, clearly, right? And it's, it's just, it's almost a silly, laughable doctrine, uh, full preterism. But we have to address it because people are actually falling for this today. Um, so Jesus 
In fact, it says also in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So again, he's making the point that you're not going to miss it. There's no secret you know, coming. It's not like he just quietly came, spiritually came. Um, it says, The lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west. It's going to light up the whole sky, the whole world. I mean, it's a cosmic event. People ask, how is that? How is everyone going to see him? It's a cosmic event where God himself is like breaking through the, the physical elements of like heaven and earth. And he's just going to he's going to break through. We're going to see it. You know, it's going to be uh, supernatural. Um, and so it will be a very visible, literal, worldwide, global event that everyone will see. And that's how we know it's the real coming not this Antichrist that also is, is going to come. I think a lot of these weird doctrines will tie into the Antichrist because they'll say, oh yeah, see, Jesus came, we, established, we have peace now in the world, we're in the millennial reign now, you know, um, but we'll know when Jesus comes, right? Matthew twenty four thirty again, the Olivet Discourse, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. We'll, we'll, it'll appear, we'll see it. How do you allegorize that? You know, you can't. So finally, Hebrews 9.28, And unto them that look, look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So he'll, again, he'll appear. <clears throat> so there's no way to around this. For they literally have, I, I like asked preterists. I'm like, anyone is a preterist can explain this. And I looked up all the, you know, the, um, the sites. And there's no answer other than just to say it's allegory. It's spiritual, it's symbolic, you know, and that's really not an adequate answer when it comes to scripture, right? So there's no other way around it. Um, also, you know, how many comings are there? Is Jesus like came back and he's going to come back a third time or just not going to come back or like, you know, it doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> He comes back, grabs people, goes away, and comes back. You know, like, it's like three or four comings. Kills the people, like, goes back, and he yeah, goes, like, he's not adequate to just come back and it's done. It's got to, you know, do it, do it in steps progressively. So, <laughs> yeah. So, how do you explain the sun and the moon being darkened, or the stars falling from uh, the sky, or this, or this, or the heavens being rolled up like a scroll? You know, that's what it says, right? Uh, it's going to actually, there's going to be cosmic disturbances during this time. Um, the preterist also has a difficult time explaining Peter's words in Second Peter 3.10 about the destruction of the present physical universe. Second Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That sounds very literal to me. I mean, I don't know how you allegorize that. Yes. The angelists, millennialists that I'm aware of use the scripture to support their viewpoints. They say, see, Jesus came, he's seated in heaven, and when he comes again, he's coming to destroy the earth. So hmm. <clears throat> Interesting. So they have three comings. <laughs> it, it bypasses the millennial, and it just, when he comes back, <clears throat> the new earth is established immediately after this earth is burned up. Interesting. Okay, so some take that view. Yeah. Okay. I'm aware of, of I don't know a lot of preterists that are. Yeah. Prominent, but the partial preterists, mm -hmm. I've heard. This. Right. The partial preterists will I say. He's still coming back, yeah. you know. But then they'll use scriptures like this. Right. Like, See, he is coming, but he's coming to destroy. Right. Yeah. The partial preterist is like half, they're like half wrong, you know. So it, it kind of, but the full preterist is like, no, this isn't, even this isn't going to happen. This is all just symbolic of, of uh, you know, fire did come from the Roman arrows and destroyed uh, Jerusalem, you know, the, Jerusalem was set on fire. I mean, it, it was the the you know elements did melt to some degree at, at that time. But again, it's not a. This is clearly this is saying the heavens shall pass, um, the elements shall melt. So it's all going to pass with a great noise. The elements and the heavenly bodies, like the cosmos itself, will melt with fervent heat. 
the earth itself will be burnt up. Is this a nuclear, you know, uh, blow up? I, I don't know. Or is it just supernatural? God's just going to, you know, destroy everything. Uh, probably more likely just supernatural. And a nuke. Probably both, right? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, a new heaven and a new earth will be instituted. And they just see this as referring to the burning of the countryside of Jerusalem and the toppling of the established Jewish religious order is what they the full preterist just says this is just a toppling of the religious order of, of the Jews with that that time that age is now finished um, they also claim that the elements referred to here is a reference to the elements or the principles of the Mosaic law that it was the law that was burned away um, or if we could try to you know I don't know. It, does, it doesn't make sense exactly, right? It, it, any way you read it, it's a physical, literal um, burning of, of the world. Second Peter 3, 5 through 7, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens are of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the reason I bring this up is if the preterist is saying it's all symbolic of, it's not a literal you know, destruction of, of the entire globe, of the entire earth, uh, well, Second Peter in context frames it first as the global, uh, global worldwide flood you know, first the water was destroyed, uh, the earth was destroyed by water, and then it'll also be destroyed by fire in totality. So you can't say it was just Israel. If, if you're saying it's just Israel, then you also have to say that the flood wasn't a global flood, that it was localized, right, if you're consistent. So it's important to read that context. If the flood was global, then the melting of the elements will also be global because that's how Peter describes it. <clears throat> so he says it'll next time, it'll be destroyed by fire. Uh, Zechariah 14.4, concerning the return of Christ. Again, it says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So it's, again, the feet are mentioned. This is literal. Uh, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Okay, so we have a physical description of the feet of Jesus. The returning point of Jesus is the Mount of Olives. That's where he's going to return. He's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is going to split in half by his mere presence, simply that he, that he set his foot on it. There's going to be a great valley in between, is, is what it says. So as far as I know, the Mount of Olives hasn't been split in half yet, right? Um, some say, well, there's a valley, there's like a little valley going through right now. And it, Okay, that's not what it talks about. So, And if there was, that was always there. Um, and it just, really, it just doesn't make sense. Really, this, this preterist, the full, at least the full preterist view, uh, can easily be refuted. The partial preterist view, I don't agree with either, uh, but eh, I give them a little bit of like, okay, at least you're probably a believer, you know. Um, but what about the comets and a third of all the trees and, and a third of all the grass being burnt up and the rivers being made bitter and hail mingled with fire coming down out of the sky and a third of all men being killed by these plagues and by the destroying angels in the book of Revelation. You know, when did that happen? Uh, Revelation 21, 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. There was no more sea. I can go down to California, not that I would want to. Maybe I'll go to Florida, you know, instead and check out the coasts. There are still seas and oceans, right? The Bible says there will be no more sea. Um, so we can verify that we still have oceans. This has not yet taken place. And, no more sun. and no more sun in the in the new heaven and new earth, right? God's glory will will light it up. So, um, and then here's yeah. Sea like um, because a lot of times a sea is like when the land is broken up and there's like it's. Coming 
coming in between like land masses and stuff, okay. you know, like the Caspian Sea and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like I always thought like what if it just means like the earth is all back together. So like the continents come yeah, back? So there's not any like sea. But could be. Still yeah. There could be in the in the end times there'll be a new we don't know what the geography exactly will be. You know, but yeah, it's it's a well, we'll possibility. Right. Right. Could be. That's int that's an interesting interesting view uh to look at. <clears throat> so here's a here's another key passage and we've just got a few more, but here's another key passage that destroys the preter's view that Jesus' return was merely symbolic or spiritual and invisible. Uh, look at Acts 1, 9 through 11. This is Acts 1. This is the angel speaking to the disciples of Jesus after Jesus' ascension to heaven, right? So Jesus ascended to the Father, right? After his resurrection, after he displayed himself to the disciples, he, he bodily went up and ascended. That's the ascension of Jesus to God the Father, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, so first they're, they're looking, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So notice how many times they said, seen him, beheld, gazing, looked, right? It's all visual, it's all literal and physical. And the, and the angel said in the same way that he went up, is the same way that he's going to return. So it's reciprocal. In the same manner, it's going to be a literal return, physical return. And they said this at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It was like, you know, was, Jesus' ascension was even near the Mount of Olives or at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Um, and so he's going to return to the same general location in the same exact way. Um, so if, again, if you're following the logic of the preterists, if the second coming was only symbolic, they would then have to say that the ascension was also symbolic. And then their whole argument falls apart. So, because um, I think they even say Jesus went up to heaven, but then they're not consistent with uh, this passage here in, in uh, Acts 1. So that's intentional in the word of God, this passage. You know, there's a reason why God said he will return in the same exact way that he left. Uh, that's not an accident. So he's going to return, you know, bodily, physically, and literally. Uh, Revelation 22, 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So... You know, no more curse, no more sin. We don't see that today. Revelation 21, 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. I don't know how they explain any of this, you know. Neither shall there be any more pain. They, they can't. There is no explanation. Uh, none of this has been fulfilled. Um, I'll just give you another major passage that they use, and then we'll kind of just read a few verses, because I know there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of material, but <clears throat> another passage that preterists use in case you run across them and they bring this up, you, you can have ammo to, to uh, refute it. Um, in Matthew sixteen twenty eight, Jesus is speaking about his second coming. And he says to his disciples, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, so that's another tough one. <clears throat> Jesus says to his disciples, some of you standing here won't die until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So the preterist was like, there it is. That's our, that's our passage, you know. Uh, it came in AD 70 shortly after, and that was the end of it. Revelation is fulfilled, you know, and, and that's it. It's the end. Um, all right, so that's the very last verse in Matthew 16. It's Matthew 16, 28. Now, if you remember, the original scriptures, the original scriptures, 
We didn't have books yet, you know, where you just kind of open up books and, and flip the pages. And、uh, we didn't even have those chapter and verse divisions in the Bible, in the original scrolls, right? <clears throat> so we didn't have any of that. In fact, the first book that was ever published on a printing press, on the Gutenberg press, was the Bible. The Bible was actually the first book. That ever came into existence, and that itself is pretty amazing.、Uh, it's a foundation of all learning, right?、Um, they wanted the reason that books even came about is that you had these long scrolls, and if you wanted to go to Matthew, let's say you know sixteen twenty-eight, you'd have to unroll the whole scroll and find it, and there was no divisions, there were no chapters, no verses. Eventually. They came up with the idea of taking these scrolls and cutting them up into like smaller sections, and binding them together,、uh, and sewing them together, basically. And that's how the book was invented by theo by Christians.、Uh, the book itself, in its present form, was invented by Christians. I think that's a pretty big deal.、Um, and so, all that to say that this verse is the very last verse in Matthew 16. <clears throat> so if you read it continuously, these chapter divisions are artificial, in many ways. They're for our convenience. If you go to the very next chapter, Matthew 17, the very next section. Remember, there were not even been paragraph breaks. It was just from 16:28 to 17:1, and it says in Matthew 17:1, <clears throat> and after six days Jesus taketh Peter. James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, <clears throat> and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. So in Matthew 16, where he said, "Some of you are not going to die until you see the kingdom of heaven coming," he was talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. He himself was in a vision, was glorified with his returning body, with his glorified body that he's going to have during the second coming, and even Moses and Elijah were there. Perhaps the two witnesses of Revelation,、um, Moses and, and Elijah, and、uh, they saw it. And so notice that in Matthew sixteen twenty eight, he doesn't say all of you. He doesn't say you're all going to see this happen before you know you're all going to witness the second coming. He says there be、uh, some standing here, right? So all of the apostles lived after eight, most of them lived until after AD seventy,、um, if not all. And he's saying some of you. And then in Matthew seventeen, he only takes up Peter, James, and John. So some of them did see the second coming or vision of it, but they literally saw it with their eyes. You know, they they had it, they actually got to see it. So that's how we understand that passage. It's not saying that Jesus, you know, was going to return before some of the apostles died. It's that they were going to see it in a in a vision in a supernatural event.、Um, All right, so I'll end with this today because we've covered a lot. There's a lot more you can dig into this topic. But is Nero the beast of Revelation? You know, what? Why do they say? Why does they say Nero was actually the Antichrist,、uh, or is Nero merely a foreshadow of the ultimate Antichrist who is to come? Which I believe he's a foreshadow, right? He's a type, an example.、Um, Now you know Nero was relentless in his persecution of both Jews and Christians. I mean, this guy was an antichrist. He was a monster. You know, I mean, this guy was very evil.、Um, the greatest Roman persecution was under Nero,、uh, as well as the, the Jews.、Uh, but that's not the only reason they say he was the antichrist. They say because his name in Greek and Hebrew has a value of six six six. That's the claim. If you might have heard that, that Nero in the Hebrew or the Greek is six six six, and so they were encoding in the Book of Revelation.、Uh, they were speaking in, in a you know in code, saying that it's really Nero. But the thing is, Nero's name in Hebrew or Greek doesn't actually equate to six six six. That's false. It's not actually the case. This has to do with Jewish numerology or gematria. And in order to come up with six 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 in the Greek, 
you actually have to add an N to Nero's name. So it's not Nero, it's Neron. And you also have to add the word Caesar. So it's Neron Caesar is actually 666. So it's not pure, you know, it's not a, it's not a pure formula. They have to add an extra character. They have to add his title. And if you do that, if it's Neron instead of Nero, then it is 666, but that's not very accurate or precise. Others say it actually adds up to 616 if you just do Nero, uh, Nero Caesar. Um, and so even that, you know, they try to correct the Bible and say, well, really 666 was a mistranslation and it's actually 616 is the number of the beast, which the majority manuscripts don't support that. There might be like a one corrupt manuscript, like an Egyptian uh, Alexandrian type manuscript. Uh, by a cleric, you know, clerical error in like one very minor manuscript that has that. But the vast majority of all manuscripts, um, the, the majority text, the Textus Receptus of Erasmus, all of these are 666. And so that, that whole theory just doesn't add up. Um, you could look more into that. I just wanted to give you that brief uh, tidbit. So I'll end with this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So it's a clear picture of the rapture. There is a future rapture of the church. It says those of us who remain and are alive during which period? During the tribulation period, right? That's the context that he's talking about. Those of us who, who are alive during that time and you know are not killed are not beheaded we don't take the mark of the beast we're like hiding out in the wilderness somewhere uh trying to avoid the drones that they've sent after us and you know whatever like technology and face scanning technology whatever they have right um those of us who make it there will be some who make it we, you know that will make it out of the tribulation those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. He's not, who is he talking to here? He's not singling out the Jews here. He's talking to the church in the book of Thessalonians. Thessalonians were the Greeks. They were the, the Greek believers. The Gentile believers is who Paul is talking to here, saying those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, so that's the comfort we have that Jesus is coming back. And uh, it's not something that's past. That would leave us with no hope. So hope this has been informative. Um, we'll be back in our Bible study. I think we're in 1 Corinthians 12. It's been a little like three, four weeks. So I'm trying to remember, but I think we're in 12. Uh, we're going to get into, uh, if, if it is 12, that's going to be on the different, like the gifts of the spirit and, uh, we'll get into, into some of that, unless we're in 11. I'll have to go check. So I think we're in 12. All right. So we'll be back next week uh, in the book of Corinthians in our, in our roundtable Bible study. And then I you know, have many sermons planned. I really want to go deep into these topics, into both the scriptures, and help us to understand some of these different systematic theologies and different views that are out there. Uh, so we'll come back to all of that. Hope you guys have a great week. Thanks for all coming. We had a nice full house today, which is always nice. And uh, God bless you all. Just end in prayer. Father God, we thank you, God. I just pray for 
a deeper understanding of doctrine and of your word, God, of the purity of your word. Help us to read your word for just what it says plainly and, and simply and in context without bringing our own views into the Bible. Let the Bible correct us, God, where we're wrong and teach us where we can go deeper. Uh, let it just be our light and our guide, God. We stand on the word of God and we thank you for that. I do pray that you bless everyone and all those who are sick, who are recovering from being sick, who are um, <clears throat> like Wayneine and, and Jerry as well, God, that you just be with them during this time, God. Uh, you can help them more than any of us can. And I, I do pray that you use us as the instruments of, of your church, God, as, as the body to be a comfort and a help to them in this difficult time for them as well. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.